Nice. Born and raised in the United States, Jeff Peterson is a regular commentator on U.S. politics. And as a member of the board of the American Chamber of Commerce in Canada, Jeff has organized, chaired, and spoken at numerous Decades American experience in journalism, fundraising, government relations, and public relations in the United States and Canada. He's also a film and television actor and a media commentator on U.S. politics based here in Vancouver. He's been Vice President for Development, Communications, and Marketing at the Pacific Salmon Foundation since 2009. And before moving to Vancouver in 2007, he worked for seven years in Washington, D.C. as an Association Executive Director, Journalist, and Communications Officer for two NGOs. Please welcome Michael Manier. Finally, Mark Pickup. He is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Simon Fraser University. He's also a visiting fellow in the Department of Politics at the University of Oxford. He is a specialist in comparative politics and political methodology. His research falls primarily into four areas, political identities, vote choice, the economy and democratic accountability, conditions of democratic responsiveness, and polls and electoral outcomes. Mark Pickup, please welcome Mark. Okay, guys, five minutes each. Uh, Jeff, you're up first. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, and thank this, you um, to uh, extremely interesting uh, 10 days or so of Public Square. My five minutes begins now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let me tell you um, a couple of observations I've got concerning uh, concerning Nick's comments. First of all, I don't believe, uh, despite the dark title, The Anger of Nations, uh, and despite Trump attempting to uh, tap a populist vein in, in the U.S. electorate, I'm not sure that's why he won the election. I think he won the election because of uh, an overarching desire for change and the history of the U.S. is that when a president's been in office for two consecutive terms, there's a 6.9% loss for his party going into the next election. That combined with a terrible candidate, Hillary Clinton, is what I think put, uh, put Trump in the, uh, in the Oval Office. Now, a couple of observations, we'll probably get back to that during our discussion, but a couple of observations from, um, from Nick's uh, slide. Um, the susceptibility point. Is Canada susceptible to this sort of uh, anger or populism? And uh, good discussion point for tonight. I would submit perhaps not. Not like Europe and not like the uh, US. Unlike uh, the European nations, Canada has retained its sovereignty. I think there's a lot of anger in Europe that emanates from the fact that the EU has taken away in part um, the sovereignty of what were nation states. And people are resenting that. Um, in uh, populism arises because people are scared and they look for scapegoats and it's not always economic um, worries, it can be immigrants and those are the scapegoats and in Europe we've certainly seen a lot of um, worry arise due to the influx of refugees walking into Europe and Canada um, they're not walking in, a posed from a, a few recently across the Manitoba border in the snow but they're walking in from the US and it's not the same sort of Concerned, Canada is able to police its borders in a in a different sort of way, and therefore I think the threat is lower for that cause of populism and anger. Um, as an American, um, I, I observe that Canada is incredibly tolerant. We're, uh, we're a tolerant people here, and we we're proud of our mosaic and um, and and, and, and welcoming and, and 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 yeah and 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 we're 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 a, wel a welcoming people. Um, and I think that that um, leads less to anger arising because it's just not culturally part of who Canadians are. And also, similar to Europe, but different from the U.S., Canada is, is, has, a, has a good social democracy um, and the economic grievances that arise um, from, from the, um, the very disparate uh, upper um, and lower classes in the U.S. you don't see to the same extent in Canada. Canada worries about their underclass to a greater extent. Now, differences from the United States, I would, I would argue, um, are um, the U.S. takes pride in its melting pot, and not the mosaic, but the melting pot. And I, a historical point to bear in mind is that that's contrived. The United States decided in the 1880s and 1890s 
that they'd just gone through a civil war and they needed to create a national identity. And they did so. That's where Uncle Sam arose. That's where the Star Spangled Banner and the red, white, and blue patriotism that a lot of the rest of the world mocks a bit, it, it, arrived, it arose because the United States needed to create a national identity and, uh, and its melting pot. And we can celebrate the mosaic here, and I think it's great and it's respectful um, that we that we are, are that we that we do celebrate um, diversity. But there possibly is something to keep in mind. If there's not a true Canadian identity, um, is that going to give rise to um, uh, to issues um, later on? Um, Another comment on, on one of Nick's slides, um, and that it has to do with how um, aggressive Canada should be in taking on Trump and the United States. And clearly, Canada should stand up for what is vital to Canadian interests. No question about that. Whether Canada should poke Trump in the eye with Canadian progressive values when it has to do more with Canadian attitudes towards the U.S. having it wrong and trying to be a leader, um, that's, a different, that's a different story and it may end up being a matter of crossing swords with, um, with the Trump administration and lead to problems. But one thing I think Canadians need to appreciate, and this will offend some folks, um, but as a bottom line, Canada can, can poke the U.S. in the eye multiple times, and, it, and, it, and it's not going to cause any long-term damage whatsoever. I'm absolutely convinced of that. And that, this is the offensive part, and that's because Americans look at Canadians as part of the same family, which is not what Canadians want to hear. But it's actually a great asset if the big gorilla south of the border thinks of Canadians as just like us. And Americans do. That is offensive to Canadians, but the fact of the matter is it's an asset. And so no matter how wrong, from an American perspective, Canadians might get it over, over the next uh, few years, they'll be forgiven. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, I think Hillary Clinton was a great candidate for president, and indeed she won the election. Uh, we, we have to remember that we have this uh, odd situation in the U.S. with the U.S. Electoral College versus the popular vote. And, and it's a function of the fact that in the U.S. the founding fathers wanted to have all of these checks and balances in place to make sure that we never had a a uh, tyrannical government that, that uh, <laughs> I thought I'd get a few laugh lines. <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, you know, I think Hillary Clinton was a, a very strong candidate. She was uh, certainly the most qualified person to run for president in, in as long as I've been voting, since it goes back to 1992. Uh, I don't necessarily think in hindsight that she was the right candidate for the times. And that's disappointing because as a father of an 11-year-old girl, I would have loved to have uh, seen uh, the first female president of the United States in, in my lifetime. But nonetheless, hope springs eternal. We live in a, an open society, democracy. We get to choose every four years who the, the president is. Um, I, to, the, to the dean's credit, I'm a, 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 a product of a classic liberal arts education at The Ohio State University. I have a, a go Buckeyes, thank you, Nick. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm not an expert on anything. If, if anything, I'm a, I'm a kid from Akron, Ohio, that happened to move to Vancouver, British Columbia, and I just love, uh, I love both of my countries. My, my wife and daughter and I became citizens of Canada in May, uh, and I'm very proud of, uh, of both of our, our, our countries. But I just want to tell you a little bit about my personal story. Um, I grew up in Akron, Ohio, and I went to Firestone High School. Now, why would I go to a place called Firestone High School? Tires. Akron, Ohio was and still remains the rubber tire capital of the world. We have a Firestone, a Goodrich School, a Goodyear School, uh, we had a general... So, you know, uh, I grew up in a, in a classic uh, blue-collar, working-class town. Uh, my mom's dad, my, my grandfather, worked on the Firestone tire lines for his entire career. Uh, Two of my uncles had jobs for the tire companies uh, and had good careers uh, after, after my, my grandfather. Look, there was, a, there was an understanding between the middle class and their government that if you worked hard 
and if you saved your money and you contributed to your community, uh, that, that you'd have a good life, that you could afford to own your own home. Uh, you might be able to afford a, a, a two cars in the garage. That your kids would have the chance to go to college. Um, uh, indeed, uh, my mother was the first uh, graduate of college in, in her family, and my father the same. Uh, these are emotional things, this election, aren't they? Um, it, that compact somewhere along the way uh, was lost. And, and the government, in the view of a lot of folks in states like Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Nick talked about the blue, the blue wall, that compact was not only lost, but sort of relegated to the history books. And, and people, my cousins, who are the, the sons of my uncle who worked on the tire lines, I'm the grandson of a guy who worked on the tire lines, where are the opportunities? Where are the opportunities? Um, I don't think it's all because of free trade. Uh, a lot of it has to do with automation and technology and, and information changing hands, globalization. All of these things are a part of it. But here's the bottom line. Donald Trump... <laughs> the most unlikeliest of people to be able to relate with, relate to my people from Akron, Ohio, figured out the right messages and he stayed on those messages. You know, one of the most telling things that he would say in all those debates to, to Secretary Clinton was, you've had 30 years. You've had 30 years. And, and I heard so many time and time again from people back in Ohio, I don't want a policy, I want a job. You know, we, we just sort of missed the mark in three key states. I go back to the fact that I, every morning I wake up, I remind myself, we won the election, the Democrats won the election, we lost it in three key states that Nick noted. And it's, it's, it, it's a matter of the Democratic Party, I think, not tracking to the center to take back a demographic that's shrinking, but it's a matter of tracking to the more progressive side of the, the political spectrum to pick up all those Bernie Sanders voters that stayed home because they weren't inspired by Hillary Clinton, to pick up the 130, Nick talked about the 100,000 voters between Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan that went to Trump over Clinton. How many votes did Jill Stein get across those three states? 130,000. 130,000. I'm out of time. But the fact of the matter is the Democrats have to steer left, have to steer more progressive, because that's where the future of the U.S. electorate is. So uh, Trump, uh, Brexit, the rise of radical right-wing parties in Europe, as Nick mentions, these are sort of a reaction to a common sentiment that's existing uh, in many countries, not all. Uh, but the re sentiment is a reaction to, uh, I would say, two groups of things. One is economic change and one is social change. Nick and others have emphasized the economic part. Um, you know, the, that's complex, but probably the most important part of that is growing inequality. So even if your standard of living is going up, if it's going up less compared to everyone else, you still feels like decline. But also important is the social change. And this is not true for everyone, but many people are feeling that things have changed. Their culture has changed, uh, you know, that, that society's changed, the values are changing. And it's both these that are leading to individuals tapping into that sentiment. And I think it's important that we recognize it's both. Um, because if it was just an economic threat, I think the reaction would be, I don't think Trump, uh, Farage could necessarily tap into it in the same way as they have. Um, so what we have is this common sentiment that's fueling Brexit, Trump, and, and, and these things, Le Pen, Terry um, Filters in the Netherlands. And these individuals are tapping into this sentiment, and they're tapping into it in very different, way, in different ways. Not very different, but so they're able to, it's very country specific, it's individual specific. Farage was able to tap into it because he wanted you know, to get out of the EU. Um, uh, Le Pen, you know, she's, she's an ideologue, she has policies that she wants implemented. Uh, but then there's other people like Trump who are not, it's not that he, he doesn't have values or beliefs, but he's not an ideologue. Uh, what he wants to do is he wants to lead a, a group, he wants to lead a sentiment. And he, he doesn't necessarily know, well, and he was smart enough to figure out that sentiment was there, he may not have known exactly what it was, but by sort of throwing things out there and seeing what stuck, he was able to find 
find that sentiment and, 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 and give a voice to it. Uh, so different individuals, uh, sort of it's a variation on a theme, different individuals are tapping into a common sentiment in different ways to, to fulfill different purposes, their purposes, really. Um, so I think, that, but I think that places, and that, that's the conversation I've been having, I think that places a lot of focus on those individuals and misses the sentiment, what's really happening, wh where does that sentiment come from? And until we sort of address those feelings, we're not really gonna get ourselves out of the situation we're in, uh, it, possibly in Canada as well. So, uh, you know, the, Newt Gingrich, he was talking to uh, someone on the news and they were talking about whether crime rates are increasing. Well, all statistics in the USA from, you know, depends on the place you're in, but for the most part, crime rates are going down. But Newt Gingrich said, no, no, crime rates are going up. And they said, well, no, he, here's the statistics. They're, they're from the FBI, this is not a democratic organization, right, the crime, crime's going up. And he said, you have statistics, you have facts. I have feelings. People feel like crime's going up. You can go with you know you can go with facts. I'm going to go with the feeling. Okay, that sounds like this, you know ridiculous, right? I mean, it's, he's going against truth. However, if people feel as crime's going up, maybe it's not because there's actually more crime, but because you know there's more graffiti in their neighborhood. They do feel that, and telling them you're wrong because statistics tell you you're wrong upsets them. It angers them. It tells them that you your feelings are wrong. Now, I'm not saying you say to them, you know, you're right, crime isn't that going up, but you have to figure out why they feel like crime's going up and address that. You know, why are they angry? What is it about change that's bothering them? And you have to address that, otherwise, we're gonna have the same sort of sentiment is gonna continue, and they're just gonna be upset by the usual politicians, and so these individuals, Farage, Trump, Le Pen, Herrick Wilders, can tap into that for their purposes. Okay, so can Canada, what can Canada do? Well, it, maybe it can be an example to the world, Maybe we can avoid that trap. Maybe we can show how we deal with those issues without, you know, someone like Trump taking over uh, and getting the, you know, a position of power. Uh, but I don't know if we can. Maybe it's been suggested to me that we're, we're, we're a little immune to that because we're a little bit different. But I think we've already seen at least one Canadian leader tap into that sentiment, and that's Rob Ford. I mean, that was not a small part of Canadians' population that voted for him, right? So that's, that's the hint. There's been talk about whether Lou Leary could be the Trump of Canada. I mean, he has some similar backgrounds, uh, to, to, but you know his, his policies are quite different. You know, you know some of the similarities with Trump. I mean, maybe Kelly Leach, maybe some of the policies she's trying to promote, maybe more similar. But I mean, so we're, I'm not saying that we're going to go in that direction. But it's not clear we we will avoid uh, what other countries have not. But I'd like to end with talking about millennials because we have not seen this group mobilized yet, and they are different, uh, different from that sentiment that I described that people are tapping into they don't really feel the cultural or social threat that people who are voting for Trump feel because this is the normal state of the world for them, right? They also don't perceive there to be an economic decline because again, again the current, this is the current state of the world for them. It's been this bad, uh, you know, since they've become aware of how bad things were. But that doesn't mean, but it doesn't mean they're satisfied with the high and increasing levels of inequality. So they're not thinking back to a time when things could have been better, but they do want change. Now maybe they can sort of, so maybe with the fact that they see the economic problems, but they don't feel things used to be better, and they don't feel that social cultural threat, maybe if that group will vote, could vote, maybe they could elect someone who could address the issues, but in a way that avoids the Trump trap. <laughs> feel shredded or not, but you get five minutes to respond to the responders now. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if I'm, uh, if I'm going to need uh, five minutes. You know, it's interesting, at the very beginning I talked about this is a complex issue that I'm going to put a straight line through. Uh, one thing that I didn't realize is that uh, I had Mark on the panel to kind of talk about the complexities that I agree with completely. So I guess I got my time plus Mark's five minutes. <laughs> um, but uh, three, things, three things to put on the table. Uh, first of all, and I, think, and I think this is part of the discussion, uh, Mark talking about sentiment is very true because it's how people feel and the other thing that we know from the research is how, Why do people feel in a particular way a lot of it has to do with what they see in the news and the news? I would say many times not all times, but many times lacks proportionality in terms of the reporting which makes people feel that they're at risk you know today I watched the news uh, before I came over and they were talking about the uh, influx of asylum seekers coming into Canada, and they put, Mark, I was joking with Mark, they put like 194 in Quebec, 
and then uh, 80 some people in Manitoba, and I'm not sure 90 some people in, in BC. And then, uh, and then the, uh, the reporter was talking about how big an issue and problem that this was. And I'm sure if, if anyone was of German heritage or had relatives who had accepted one million asylum seekers, they would know that the proportionality of how this had been made was not, was not real. And uh, so, you know, I think there has to be a discussion in terms of, uh, of the media's role in, uh, because it's competitive, and, and trying to base, properly base sentiment. Um, and the other thing is that, uh, you know, the, a lot of this populism, you know, the new kind of body of knowledge on this, it kind of refers to what I think, Mark, is like thin ideology, it's very thin, mm -hmm. right? It's all about how you feel. And, uh, and I think that's actually a key element here. And you know, I'll tell you the, the last point that I'd like to make is actually probably the most important point that I'd like to make tonight, is that we should not feel smug. Uh, we should not assume that Canada is better. We should not, and uh, you know, with respect, I disagree with Jeff. Uh, I don't think Canada is immune to this. If it was, politicians wouldn't be trying to play in this game. We should not be dismissing, because you know what, when we look at other countries, the first part of allowing these things to spread was to dismiss them, to say that they were different, that they were crackpots, that they were a fringe movement. And you know, I think the most positive thing that I've seen is that with this anger, there's been a counter-anger movement of people who are angry, I think it's kind of weird, angry at the other angry voters, right? People who are angry at uh, what Donald Trump represents. And uh, I think uh, one of the key takeaways, when we look at the numbers, the perception of declinism, risks in terms of the economy, the sentiment that's out there, we should not think that Canada is immune. Because like I said, it doesn't take a lot of voters to shape the elections. When the conservatives play this politics, they're looking at getting that one voter in 20. That's it, that's all they're looking for. Right, that one voter in 20 that reacts to those sensational messages and that they can convert out of the progressive column into the conservative column. Well, I know that uh, I'm not a panelist, but you know, I'm the media person here. So let me try, <laughs> let me try to tackle the, the, the question about the media because I, it raised the same issues for me. And I agree that um, when people have feelings that, they're, that they're, they're at more at risk, that there's more crime around. And it is because of when you turn on a local television newscast, you are going to see what leads will lead in a lot of places, um, particularly more so in the United States, but but here as well. And I will even admit that on my own radio network, I heard one of our newscasters talk about the flood of asylum seekers coming to Canada the other day, and I shuddered at hearing that. But 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 the problem I see with with um, trying to um, tackle the question of the media and trying to um, get a handle on how people respond to people's feelings is that the people because of social media are so much in their own echo chambers now and they are not reaching across sources of media the way they used to and which I would urge everyone to do to look at all sorts of media and then draw your own conclusions I don't know how you get past that in this world and try to get people talking outside of their own circles of influence and I'd, I'd like to hear from any of you on that whether you think that's even possible now there's a US, um, US website, people are interested in US politics on this, called realclearpolitics.com. And Real Clear Politics, every morning, has about 20 articles, and they will retitle them. And it, it'll be, Trump is an idiot, Trump is a hero. And they'll go back to back. And they're from pretty considered um, journals. And um, that, for, for a look in at the US, and the left and the right, the polar opposite points of view, um, that's a great source. So, I don't think we're not talking to each other. Uh, Americans are very loquacious. They talk to one another, they, they like to discuss, they like to argue. We go down to Washington State quite a bit, that's where our family's from. Uh, and every time we go down, they want to know about the Canadian system, and they want to know what does Canada think about Trump. And people are very open about their 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 thoughts and 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 their opinions. I actually think that the, that all of the media sources that we have, uh, it's it's a good thing that 
people have access to as much information as they, they, they do. Uh, I, I think the, the, the challenge really is, is more, in my judgment, within the U.S. political system, that you have this perception of, of people that the government has basically stopped working. That we had Obama elected, got elected twice, uh, and for two years he had a Congress of the same party and he got a couple things done. And then for the next six years it was, it was gridlock. Uh, and even though the economy was improving and things were generally getting better for the U.S., we reasserted diplo a diplomatic approach to international relations. Our people's opinion of the United States was much better. Uh, the, the fact that matters for the table stakes issues that matter to to uh, folks in the Midwest in particular, things weren't getting better, and the government just wasn't working. And people looked at Hillary Clinton, they had plenty of information about Hillary Clinton, they had plenty of information about Donald Trump, and they, they, they made a decision. So I'm not as hard on the media as, as, as others are. I mean, I, having been a journalist previously, I think we can always do it better. Uh, but but the, talking about the media is just an excuse. The fact of the matter is that people sent a very clear message in this election. And uh, they want the government to get things done. Uh, and Trump and the Republicans are going to have at least four years to, to put their plan in place. And uh, I think Nick made the point. My wife and daughter and I were, were proudly out there marching in our march here in, in, in Vancouver. I think this is going to be really good for democracy. It's going to be good for democracy in the United States. It's going to be good for democracy in Canada and, and elsewhere to get people out uh, talking to one another, marching for things that they care about. It's, it's a good recharge for the old democratic batteries, I think. I, um, you know, I think the media can be held accountable for some things. I think you know, the fact that they put Trump on over and over and over again because it was good for their ratings rather than because he was saying anything sane, uh, I think his media can, I think media can be held accountable, and maybe something will happen like that in Canada. Though Leary is far more interesting to listen to than, than many other candidates, so you know you might be given a lot of free media time as a consequence. But in terms of having individuals sort of read media that's on the other side, I don't see that as a solution because we have very strong confirmation bias, which is to say when we read something that sort of agrees with what we already believe, we immediately go, "That's absolutely right." When we see something that disagrees with us, we're very good at saying, well, that's why this is wrong. It's completely wrong. In fact, some of the studies show that when you force people to read media that sort of counters their opinions, their opinions that they already had become even stronger because you give them the opportunity to sit there and go, here's all the reasons that's wrong. I really am right. right? So reading the other side isn't the, the solution to that problem. So I, I mean, there are... Uh, what, what's the solution? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, well, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll have to talk about that. Yeah, you listen well, to the same piece. Yeah, let that down. But, right? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think what Marcus put his finger on is the way things are, but not the way things should be. And I'd like to say that there's something more fundamental, that the structure of consuming media has influenced our democratic dialogue. And if I can say that, it goes to your, your echo chamber. So my mother-in-law is from Cape Breton. She went to St. of X. She has a customized news feed. She wants to know what's happening at St. of X. She wants to have the Cape Breton Post stream to her site. She wants the Ottawa Citizen. She wants the Missoulian, because her sister's in Montana, lives in Missoula, right? She's in her own echo chamber. But, so think of it this way. Technology has allowed and facilitated and enabled people to be in their echo chamber and to be happy in their echo chamber. But what is the old model? The original model is you open the newspaper or you listen to the radio or you watch TV and you have a shared experience with other citizens and you read things that you don't look for. You come across other things that you're not exposed to, other opinions and so forth, right? Other opinions, other pieces of information, other facts. And that is a very different experience because then you're no longer in your echo chamber. And if I could use the university as an example, if we had a university that was online where you stayed at home echo chamber, how would you compare that to the university experience when you show up and you meet students and academics from other faculties, where you informally bump into them, where you talk to people who are studying other things, where you go into the public square and engage people, you get out of your echo chamber. And I think what we've lost 
right? What we have lost is the whole, you know, I would say one of the fundamentals to having some type of common shared experience, right? And the internet and Twitter has broken that all down, right? So we have to think of ways to change the structure of the news, right? To change the structure of the news so that perhaps we can get some vegetables. Right? I'm not talking about politicians. But we can have a more diverse... No? Is that possible? Did you prepare well, no, it's, that good. The, no? It, the, the thing is that though, you, you, you're talking about doing that. Of course, I'm all for that. But, but you're, you're trying to do that in spite of politicians like Donald Trump or Kelly Leach who are tailoring their messages down to very fine granular points that they know are going to reach... Can, can I say something? Yeah, go ahead. That's why you're here. Here's a question. 20 years ago, if someone said something that was not true, would that be published in the newspaper? Would it be published in the newspaper? If a politician lied or said something wrong, would it be published in the newspaper? Do you think? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. You know what? When I first started off as a bolster, it was a much more torturous journey because there were actually two calls. Like, so now, whenever I would say uh, any poll, don't tweet this, but any poll that's <laughs> out there uh, has, has not, many of the times it's not checked, the questions are not asked, people don't know who the sponsor is. There's just not, there's so much pressure on the media that that's not, that there's no due diligence that there was. So when I started off as a pollster, I received two telephone calls, because reporters are still talking to people uh, by telephone, but I received two telephone calls. The first call was from the reporter, and the reporter be contacted me to file his or her story and talk about poll. The second call was actually a fact checker. You know what they do? They call and say, okay, so Nick, are these all the questions that you asked? And who sponsored this survey? And can you tell me a little bit about yourself? And what other research is out there? And, and I knew that they did that because the poll would not be published if that other step of fact-checking didn't take place. Because someone in the newsroom, and I'm just speaking from my personal experience as some guy in Kingston, right, who did a call from the Kingston Week Standard, where even for them, in a small media market, at that point, the newspaper called to validate that something was actually legitimate or not. So I would say that, uh, so here's philosophy, I know the philosophy major is over there, you know, uh, you know, when we come to the, tr you know, what is the social responsibility of media to report or not report something that they know is factually incorrect. I, I, I don't want to get bogged down in the media, not because I'm a member of it. <laughs> I, I know there's, there's so many other things to talk about, and I do want to bring up Kelly Beach and Kevin O'Leary again, because um, I think the Trump effect is real here in Canada in that conservative race. And um, Kelly Leach has had more airtime than, than probably her standing in the race merits uh, because of the, some of the inflammatory things that she's been saying. What I'm wondering from you, Nick, is it, from what research you've been able to do, is it working? Well, I'm not very popular with Kelly Leach. <laughs> uh, according to, so the way I look at it, there are kind of two universes here. Um, from a, a research perspective. There's the known universe of Canadians and what they think, so we know who Canadians are, and we can reach them and do research. And then there's, I'll call the, and I don't say this judgmentally, the unknown universe, research universe, of Conservative Party members and trying to do research among them. So for us, we can, because there's no list to access, we do research and ask Canadians, 4.8% uh, like, uh, would identify Kelly Leach as uh, the most appealing candidate, so one out of every 20. That number keeps coming up. It's kind of like the Da Vinci Code. Uh, <laughs> it's found her the most appealing. Uh, among Canadians, candidates like Michael Chong, Lisa Ray, Maxime Bernier, and, uh, and our entrepreneur in the Shark Tank uh, did well. And one third of Canadians basically said that none of the Conservatives were appealing. But you know, the thing is, is that Kelly Leach is not running in a general election. She's running to be leader of the Conservatives. And uh, she knows that, you know, that the type of politics that she plays is very good for getting earned media, right? And, uh, and eyeballs, and it's actually good for raising money. 
in, the, in parts of the conservative tribe. Not all parts, but in certain parts. So uh, she's there because it works, or it can work in certain circumstances. But the reality is, I guess that we get into, you know, do you burn the conservative village, right? Does she, does she end up burning the conservative village through her victory, if she ever did win, by playing that kind of politics? Because the reality is, at least now, I'm not saying in the future, but right now, Canadians are not into that. And I think what's happened in the United States has sensitized us. Right? It's kind of like, oh, not sure about that. <laughs> I'm interested. Do you think that's true? Do you think that the Canadians are sort of reeling back in horror at what's happened in, to the, in the United States? Oh, my sense is yes. Um, no, I, but I, I don't... I, and, I, and I think you look at the, the, the whole of Canada, and for reasons that I tried to say earlier, even if someone captures the conservative um, leadership um, take, by taking taking a populist tone, I don't think they're going to. I, I don't think that can take them all the way. And you know, Mike and I agreed on CBC Radio that that Trump could not possibly win the election with that sort of tone, um, and if he captured the Republican nomination. So, what do we know? I have no idea why we're here. <laughs> Uh, you know what, I, I have a fairly uh, readable American accent, I'm told, a Midwestern kind of accent. I am tired of talking about Trump. Everybody asks me about Trump. Say, Are you American? Yeah. Oh my God, what the hell is going on out of Yeah, I think Canada's and Canadians are, are concerned about it. So. Uh, I, I wouldn't speak about the, the, whether it's going to... Uh, so you know, one of the thing I didn't say while I was bloviating in my first five minutes, um, you know, what can Canada do? Um, I, I don't. How many of you listened to Trump's address to Congress a couple days ago? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you like threw up a little bit in your mouth when he mentioned Canada? <laughs> and and you know, and talking about immigration. You know, Canada has this great immigration system. The notion of openness and that we are going to be great together because of openness is something that is firmly ingrained in this country's aura, and it is accepted across the political spectrum. And the wonderful thing about our system in Canada, and I went through it, is that it is objective. It is not subjective. And you made it. And I made it. And it's objective. I made it because of my wonderful wife, Dr. Elizabeth Marshall, who's a professor at Simon Fraser University. She was the smart one that got offered a job here, and I got to come in behind her. So thank you, Dr. Kevin, for bringing us up here. Anyways, this is what we have to be as Canadians and as a country. We have to be a not just a symbol, but, but the example that you can succeed and thrive as a country because of immigration. Uh, and, and, and I think the Prime Minister has done a great job to date of sort of making sure that those values are clear to Trump and to his administration uh, and, and doing it in a way very politely as we do as Canadians uh, without antagonizing Trump. But I really do think that is something that all of Canada and Canada's government and something us as Canadians have to be proud of and talk about and, and continue to push uh, is this notion of openness and that it really does make a country uh, great. I believe Canada had two mentions Tuesday evening um, at, at, uh, at the, the President's address to Congress and they were both very positive and I think it reflects well on what the Prime Minister must have said to him behind closed doors and at the press conference um, when he was in Washington. I mean, it, that, that relationship is quite clearly off to a better start than I think some people feared. Mark, I'm interested to hear from you about about the Prime Minister. Make, let's make this personal. What what should he be doing in response to Trump? Um, well, I so other than the handshake, other than the handshake, yeah, uh, he did that right. Really. Um, I mean, I think so. It's 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 it's. I think I agree very much with Nick with the idea that it's it's a business relationship. Uh, it's an important relationship to us, and I think Canada has to sort of keep reaching past Trump to Americans. Uh, and say, look, you know, we like Americans, we like America. Uh, Trump may not share all the values that Canadians share, but he's, he's just the president at the moment. Um, we have to deal with them, and I think, you know, so I think that's probably our best, the best approach. I mean, whether or not, you know, if this question is asked whether or not this is something that could happen in Canada, I mean, I think the sentiment is there, so it could, but I do think many of the factors that led to Trump and Brexit are not nearly as strong 
in Canada. So that may save us. The other thing is Canada really does have a history of looking to the U.S. and going, that went wrong, let's not do that. <laughs> um, I mean, even, our, even the nature of our federal system was built by after looking at, oh, a civil war, we don't want that. We better have stronger national institutions. So, I mean, we do have a history of looking at the great, you know, great American experiment and learning from that experiment. Is that what got Trudeau elected in the first place then? <laughs> Or, or no, the younger. I mean, I mean, the reaction to Obama, or you don't want to do that, or was that a reaction to Harper? That's what I, I mean. Harper's seen much closer to what we're seeing now. Yeah, I, I don't think Trudeau was elected because of maybe a reaction to Harper. I mean, that was a time for a change type movement. But I do think that what's happening in, in the world can actually help the liberals stay in power. You know, we saw, so that he had a ridiculous honeymoon period, but it, his, uh, uh, that is Trudeau. And his honeymoon period began to drop as Nick's polling, you can follow it, I follow it every time you send a poll out. And, uh, but if you look at his polling, this soon, almost as soon after he went and talked to, to Trump, then he went to, to Germany, he went to Europe and talked to them, it popped back up again, because that contrast, you know, he's able to take a leadership role and say, hey, we're different than Trump, we're different from what's happening, uh, you know, disintegration, some of the anti-European uh, movements. So I think that, you know, what's happening in the world does actually give it an opportunity for the Liberal Party, which might actually help them in the polls in the next election. Yeah, I, you know what, I think uh, one of the things the Liberals have to make sure that they don't do is spend their time, the Prime Minister, outside of Canada advancing the progressive movement because he needs to focus on, if, if he's the leader of the progressive movement in Canada, on what's happening here. And you know, to your point about openness, let's talk about Holland for a second, right? If you think of a country that is more open, progressive, tolerant, right? What country comes to mind? Holland. Do you know what's going to happen this month? This month, probably the party that is the most anti-immigrant will garner the greatest number of seats. Intolerant, open, easygoing uh, Holland. And uh, is unlikely to form government. Yes, unlikely to form a government. But you know what? It just, they don't have to. Uh, this is kind of like you know poisoning the well. You don't. You know, you, it just takes one. You know, to kind of uh, upset there's, that. But so. There's a different history with Holland than what we're seeing here, and different from what we see in the United States. And here, immigrants come into the country and they are embraced in a, in a much different way than what you see in the European nations. You end up with immigrant ghettos in Amsterdam, in Rotterdam, in, in, in most European cities, and the, the nation, the Dutch nation or the Flemish nation or whatever, may have existed, it has existed for centuries. And, and, and it's very difficult for them to open their arms and embrace newcomers. And therefore, the newcomers don't feel like there's any reason to try to even assimilate. But, and they don't. But let, let, let's be honest here. We're not immune. I know, and I didn't use immune. I said the, the slide, and I, I don't think I used immune. I, I, I was saying that I don't think we are as susceptible as... Europe or he the is United a lawyer. States. You have to be there with yeah, him. Lawyer. <laughs> I believe I describe your opinion as immune, so that's my fault. <laughs> okay, I think we should probably open it up to the